This is how I felt stuffing all my videos full of mid-roll ads this year. They got so filled, it looked like something you'd find under the Vortag on E621. I I'm really not helping my not a furry case here, huh? And I'm not a fur. Hi again, guys, and welcome to the last video of the year. It's convenient that my upload schedule fell on New Year's Eve, huh? Instead of reflecting on me as a person or the defining events of 2022, it seemed like a good time to do a year wrap-up of me, my friends, and your guys' favorite TikToks. Or short videos as well. The only criteria was that it had to come out this year. I asked for your favorites on my alt Twitter at quite bruh, if you were wondering. You should follow it. That is if Twitter doesn't go belly up first. I don't know. But here's the thing. Uh, I was completely lying. I actually want to talk about stuff I liked this year in general with like neat little title cards and pretending I'm some media analysis YouTuber instead of a commentary channel. It's like me pretending to make better content than I do because it makes me feel better. But the thing is, I know my viewers don't have the kind of patience for that. That's not why you're here. So I'm still going to be talking about things I liked from 2022 in no particular order while intermittently playing random memes I watched this year. That way, maybe your attention span will let you stick around for longer. Sound good? It seems like a fair compromise to me. Now, for the last time in 2022, if you enjoy this video, there will be this big card at the end that takes you to another one like it, and only 20% of y'all are subscribed with notifications on. If you sub and hit that bell icon, you'll never miss an upload, and you can always undo it later. That car was basically how the Batmobile moved in Matt Reeves' 2022 film, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson. Also, it was hopping around, looking all cute, like exactly the same as Robert Pattinson. The Batman was the first piece of media I was overhyped for in 2022. This is the best Batman movie, hands down. I don't know if it's a better movie than The Dark Knight, but it's definitely better at being about Batman. <laughs> I've been obsessed with Robert Pattinson since I saw him in some movies at post-Twilight. It was mainly The Lighthouse and Good Time. Great movies. And weirdly, it's kind of turned me into a Twilight convert. <laughs> I haven't watched those movies still, probably won't, and I know Rob hates them personally, but I've decided to retroactively make them a part of my personality. And The Batman was another perfect opportunity to find a main character whose lifestyle I'm supposed to take as a cautionary tale to not be like. The movie He's practically screaming at you, whatever you do, do not imitate him. You do not want to be like him. And instead I go, wow, he's just like me for real, before trying to pretend I'm all moody and I don't enjoy the company of my friends. Mom, did we just pregame a, a funeral? Shut the fuck up and act sober. I Seriously. Seriously. I don't even... Yeah, that's essentially how I felt leaving the theater. Three hours in a different dimension and I came out feeling like I'm high off battery acid. The movie was really pretty to look at. I think it's called cinematography or something. I'm not exactly describing this in film auteur terms. I have the consumer brain through and through, and that's why I thought the action was super satisfying to watch. Especially when he just chucks a bat at a dude. Get it? It's like, because he's Batman? The night me and my friends got back home from watching that movie, we unironically turned all these LEDs behind me red and started playing the main theme. I think I broke my subwoofer blasting it. And the only reason was because we thought it was cool and we are bad at telling the difference between reality and fiction. I don't know what moments I'm actually awake for. Acting challenge, you're the blue line. Oi, excuse me. Do you know where I can talk in general, it was a really good watch and had me glued in my seat for the entire three-hour runtime. I watched it multiple times and is easily the best superhero movie of the year. Not that competition was stiff. Marvel has been shitting the bed pretty hard recently, and now DC has taken every movie they had planned, doused it in gasoline, and burnt it to ashes. But hey, at least we got this gem out of it. If you've been on the channel for a while, and I mean literal years, back in 2018 when my voice cracked every other sentence, you may remember that I gushed about this one rapper, J.I.D., when the album DiCaprio 2 came out. Ever since then, for the last four years, I have been on my last breath, my last inch of hope, just starving for more Jid content. And that fella absolutely delivered with the forever story. <laughs> oh, yo. Wow! <laughs> wow, what a great clip for the album I'm talking about. The crocodile swarming after the food he tossed was me refreshing my Spotify on release night, just hungry for it. And the gator who got shovel smacked on his head is how it felt to hear that album. <laughs> But not in like a painful way, more in like a good way that doesn't hurt or give you a concussion. Kenny Mason is another artist I adore, and he has multiple god-tier performances on this album, and I'm really just happy to see him get that kind of spotlight. Pretty much all the features were killer, and it's just ridiculous how great all of this ended up coming out. <laughs> Yeah, 
It sucks I can't play you any songs off the album here to show you what I'm talking about, but if you're going nuts first and have never heard of J.I.D. outside of the Imagine Dragons League of Legends song, all the things that came together to make that combo should have been awful, and it defied all odds to be kinda neat, but narrowing it down to one song you should listen to to see if it's up your alley is hard as shit. If I had to pick personally though, I would start with, ironically, the last track on the album, Lauder 2. It has got great bass work from Thundercat, which is not saying much, it's Thundercat, but Jid slides over the instrumental like he's making love to it. It is so clean and it's like sex for your ears. Please give this album a listen or at least some of Jid's work. I promise there will be something there for you along the way. Don't pee on the floor to use the Commodore. I'll admit my favorite game this year is bathing, nay, writhing of the benefits of recency bias. I finished this thing like a month ago. And hell, if I'm being honest, God of War Ragnarok would have had to try very hard for me to not like it. Ever since playing the first Norse mythology God of War from 2018, I have been hankering like a league player, suffering withdrawals to find out what happens next. The combat in the first one was like nice, crunchy, felt real responsive on the very easy difficulty I played it on because I'm a pussy. And the story was so gripping that my fingers started turning purple from where it was holding me. Blood flow is less important than finishing the game at that point. And the note it leaves off on in the post credits is exactly the same as edging someone, but with like emotional investment instead of sex. It shows you Thor and his cool powers and his cool hammer and how he's large and imposing and then denies you a fight right as it's about to start. It causes actual real life pain to anybody who plays it. It's, that's how good it is. Even if Ragnarok ended up not being as good as God of War 2018, I was always probably gonna like it. And luckily I just didn't have to worry about that issue because they nailed it for me. There's obviously caveats there like, there were some things I thought could have been done better, but for the most part, they fucking hit it right on the mark. Who's your daddy? And can we share him? Because I haven't had a father figure in about seven fucking years now. Yeah, that's basically the theme of this game summarized. Daddy issues by the boatload. The characters in this game across the board are just brilliantly written and performed. It just sucks you in with how good of a job they do. The dialogue is dripping with chemistry between characters, and it's so thought out with the new characters being real standouts. You and me are pretty used to Thor and Odin as their witty and wise Marvel versions with more abs than fingers and jawlines you could cut atoms in half with. And this game really flips that on its head if you were expecting the Marvel versions to show up. These gods are kind of like all dickheads. <laughs> Thor is a fat, recovering alcoholic, good for him. At least at the start of the game, he relapses later, but a journey is not linear. And I'll tell you, that guy is a goddamn rascal. You've probably seen clips of it, but that motherfucker is playing with your feelings from the first encounter. The game kills you on purpose, like it gives you a fake quick time event that you always lose just so Thor can yank you back to life. All because he thought your ass wasn't trying hard enough. Damn. You think you can come here, become a daddy? Get a clean slate. Don't talk about my life. Ugh, you're a destroyer, like me. Then you should know what happens next. Oh no. I say when we're done. <laughs> As good as a job the actor for Thor did, I think my favorite was still Odin. I really expected some overbearing, all-powerful presence, which, to be fair, he still is, but in a way you don't expect. His main shtick is being a master manipulator, and I mean as high level as you can get at baiting other people and stringing them along like puppets. This is the easiest master baiter joke anyone's ever made. There were a few videos I watched that illustrated how I felt about Odin pretty well. These fellas put it in words that I was never gonna put together on my own. <laughs> Honored Madman's thumbnail as Odin being the godfather, but it's all father instead was just clever as hell. Like, it's funny how well the parallel between Odin's character and the word play works out, especially because Odin uses his family pantheon like a fucking mob boss. In another channel, I review every Nintendo Wii game, made a video talking about a game I'm pretty sure you can't get on the wave. I haven't really checked if there's a port, I could be wrong, but he basically deconstructed all the specific ways Odin was stringing people along throughout the story really well. Like, he spotted the actual manipulation techniques he was using to, like, confuse people and all that. You gotta have balls as strong as that dude to even consider fucking with Kratos. Speaking of, Kratos felt so good to play as per usual. There's a lot of little things they added to the combat from the last game that feel like a real progression of what in that game worked well while tidying up some of the loose ends and common complaints. Things like the lack of boss variety and literally zero aerial attacks unless you count Spartan Rage. Oh, Joey, what's up, bro? I haven't seen you in a minute. What's going on? 
Yo, what's going on, Yo, bro? What's How you doing? That's me having to pause the escapism every time I had to put the game down to actually do my job. I was sucked into this world just like I was with the first one, and it was all I could think about while I was playing it. I'm still flabbergasted it managed to give me that same depth of feeling twice. And I think that cohesion between the two is a really large part of what makes it work for me. Ragnarok feels like if the 2018 God of War just had another 30 hours of gameplay that went up in scale, scope, and diversity as it went on, it feels like the two games were written as if Ragnarok's story was always the plan the entire time. If you play these two God of Wars back to back, I think it would make a fantastic continuous experience, and I think that's helped by there only being two games in this Norse saga. I think it still could have been a great trilogy, but since it's two, it means very little time is wasted. I'm just gonna pretend that Ironwood doesn't exist. I've got a lot more I could say, but I've spent a long time on God of War already because it's likely my favorite media thing of this year, so I should probably move on. I've been watching The Boys since it first came out, but I fell off halfway through season two. Fast forward to the day after VidCon this year, and I got COVID. I was planning to go to Anime Expo the week after and be even more irresponsible than I was at VidCon, but instead I had to sit on my own inside a big b and I rented, specifically because I wanted to have people over. The irony. So with nothing to do but sit with my thumbs in my ass and then twiddle them after, I saw a lot of people talking about Boys season three at the time, so I figured, fuck it, I'll catch up. I finished up season two, got up to where everybody else was in season three, and and I was chomping at the bit waiting for the last episode. I think the thing that made it stick in my mind for this long was how much mileage we got out of that show with memes. You were seeing those well after season three had wrapped up, even now. I mean, there's a lot to choose from. There's Homelander stressing out, Homelander getting away with murdering a dude in public to some violin music, Homelander's Sigma male, I'm better than everyone speech, the deep getting accepted back into the seven. Man, there's a lot of Homelander here, but it wasn't helped by the countless amount of other TikTok sounds people were using from the show. And no surprise there, a lot of it came down to Anthony Starr's performance as Homelander. He goes, all in during every scene. There are so many quotables with striking delivery that fit the criteria for a TikTok trend. For God's sake, fucking Metro Boomin sampled Homelander's speech on his last album. It's some of the hardest shit of all time. Imagine shooting a man with your last bullet and he stands there unfazed. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it, but season three has some of the best action sequences in the show so far. Ones that were super satisfying payoffs for how long we'd been waiting on some shit like it to go down. Eurogasm is probably my favorite episode of TV all year. That's not saying much because if streaming services are lucky, they'll get me to watch like three shows a year. But still, I can't lie. I think the gross stuff is a big part of the appeal. I'm sure I'd still enjoy the show without it, but all the adult stuff I think fits the story being told, especially the comedic bits, like where the dude who can shrink down to microscopic levels, walks into a dude's urethra, and then accidentally kills him by going back to full size. That's the first episode of the season. It's not a spoiler. To me, this is like that one tongue-in-cheek reference that they had Paul Rudd make on an Ant-Man ride at Disney World. It was like a little gag about crawling up Thanos' butt. To me, the boys did that, but they fully committed and actually hiked it up several levels. Uh, this pick is very terminally online to enjoy, I'll admit that. A combination like the one in this type of video would not be possible in pre-2010 times. Basically, what these videos are is people like this guy Lego Craze, among others, taking the audio from real car crash videos, usually from r slash idiots in cars. As far as I know, the people in those clips he's used ended up making it out of those incidents okay, thankfully. But he uses those real sounds in a game to make a fictional, but several times more brutal car crash out of it in Roblox. That looked really bad, but don't worry, the crash that's from went nothing like that in real life. The guy recording was just using a Logitech C920 to record. That's the funny mic. There's something really unsettling, like morbidly funny about the real deal sound superimposed on this kid's game. Ones with an over-the-top physics engine that dramatizes events significantly. Like the people flying literally have ragdoll written on their chest half the time. It's like the difference between a real life murder case and then how they get portrayed in their biopic. At some point, we've all watched Idiots and Cars compilations just people in real life being nut jobs behind the wheel. But despite those clips being real, for some reason, it feels more raw and disturbing to me to watch the Roblox version. There's just something really visceral about it that I can't explain, even though it's like all made up. <laughs> 
This one has a special place in my heart because I have been waiting for Scorn to come out for over like a quarter of my life, and it's been an emotional roller coaster watching its development cycle. I saw the first trailer back in 2016, decided it was really cool, and that I was assigning the game to myself as a personality trait. And from there, it was like a slow trickle of new trailers and teasers from there, with release dates getting pushed back more and more until we just didn't have one anymore. At that point, it just felt like it was never gonna happen. But then, in 2020, with no new info on the horizon, and me assuming this lost beauty to be dead and gone, I'm sitting there casually watching an Xbox Games conference with my friends, and guess what showed up? Fucking scored! It jump scared me, I jumped out of my seat, I creamed my pants on the spot, and the rest is kind of a blur. The only other thing I remembered was that it was coming as an Xbox exclusive, which meant the game now had Microsoft money behind it now. The resources to finish the damn thing were now there. I was so pumped that it looked like this game might actually release. It's like being freed from purgatory, man. Fast forward to a few days before the game's release, and me and my friend are gushing over how excited we are to play the game with all the art design and how dope it looks, when my manager, who I've literally never mentioned this game to, hits me up and is like, hey, do you want an early copy of Scorn? Okay. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Right there is about where my brain was, so I said yes, got the copy, and started playing it immediately, and it's pretty much everything I wanted from it. I was always enamored with the art style and the presentation of everything on screen, and was pleasantly surprised by some creative puzzles that had their own brand of ickiness. A lot of people complained about the combat, which I definitely understand, but I ended up running past most enemies, as you don't really have to fight a lot of the creatures you come across. It feels more like they're an extension of the same rot that's taken over the foreskin-looking facility you're exploring than actual threats. The atmosphere and H H.R. Geiger-inspired art hit my brain in the exact way I was hoping it would, and it was desolation incarnate. Scorn was a really unique experience, and it was nice that, at least for me, something I'd waited so long for actually hit the mark. It happened more than once this year, now that I'm thinking about it, which is a miracle. Albums, games, shows, and movies I'd all been anticipating really pulled through for me at some point or another. Finally, I found you, Sonic! Put those grippers away! Hey, Amy, what the fuck is happening? Oh my god, those dogs are barking! Unfortunately, Sonic Frontiers was not one of those. So instead, for my list, here's an even more controversial pick. Friday Night Funk in the game, and here's the controversial part, the fandom. <laughs> my easy answer for why is that my second channel is practically built on the corpses of Friday Night Funkin' mods. I played that shit every other week because of how well it did. It is the foundation with which all my Springtrap Thirst Trap videos stand on, so I owe it my thanks for how much fucking money I made off it. But that aside, the community behind the mods are brimming with new and upcoming talent who are too damn good at what they do for how long some of them have been doing it. The community has its issues for sure, like some of the teams behind the mods were forced to work in practical sweatshop conditions to get things done on time. It was the crunch the game industry is already known for, but worse because you weren't even getting paid for your normal work. But when you look at the art, music, ideas, and just pure distilled creativity to come out of some of these mods on their own in a vacuum, take these things as they are and the passion in them is undeniable. Friday Night Funkin' is keyboard DDR. The template for the game is really straightforward, but the community has gone ahead and made any future official FNF updates pointless, because they've already added every new mechanic you could think of in one mod or another. At times, they eclipse the quality of the original game by miles. The mod scene was so active before any official content dropped that the skill ceiling just rocketed into the stratosphere. It became something that the actual dev team could probably never keep up with. The difficulty of some of the mods out there is borderline criminal. <laughs> but back on topic, some mods like Indie Cross have fully animated 2D cutscenes and voice acting. There's some with ARG elements and huge spanning narratives across multiple levels. I've played mods with like 40 songs that have unique visuals for each one and crazy ass different production across all of them. There are mods like Sonic.exe and other creepypasta based ones that are loving homages to their terminally online source material. That Sonic 1, for example, has different forms of Sonic in a horror context from history as enemies you fight against in the game, while also including several original interpretations with killer soundtracks and all of them. Playing some of the mods took me in nostalgia trips I just did not realize I was going to be going on. <laughs> And back to the music, the skill behind some of the production on these mods made me salivate. It's possible I might just have rhythm game brain rot, where doing good at a song's charting tricks me into liking the song just because I'm good at it, but I am still giddy at the thought of the person who made the music for the Hotline 024 mod, Saruki. I think that's how you say it. Just make it a beat I could rap on or some shit. The production is crazy. Please, I will pay you. Lots of money. Lots. And yeah, that's right. I still technically make music. I just haven't released any of it in nine months, or finished any of the songs that I have at the vault, or gotten someone to make sure I still to it, but I'm still making music. 
technically. It might be better next year. Now, there was definitely other stuff I really liked from 2022, but I'm just putting in here what came to the top of my head first. Let me know what your guys' favorite things were from this year in the comments. And to wrap up, I just want to do my quick generic YouTuber thanks because I genuinely do mean it. The channel turned 10 years old earlier this month. I was 12 when I put together this shithole, and this is what it's become. Having the support up to where I am now just means a lot, and it's surreal. Having people that tune in to whatever I'm feeling like talking about, both here, on the second channel, on Twitch, and whatever else, is surreal, like I said. I swear I don't take that for granted. It is a privilege, so thank you for a great 2022, and I'm looking forward to keep it pushing in 2023. That card I mentioned should be on screen. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon, or you'll die before the ball drops. Anyways, this has been Quite, and have a happy new year.